Hey everyone, drive to school. Pastor Goodman, Pastor Brademeyer, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, we talk philosophy and it's always been good. Uh, it helps sort of wrinkle my brain in the right way instead of the wrong way. Um, today we're going to talk ethics, which is important. Well, if you like to have society, I think it's important. You know, isn't it like, like me? You know, society. I live in society, right? Well, well, ethics deals with how we treat each other. You know, what's right and what's wrong. And that, of course, immediately has purchase in how I act. And so I think it's really important we understand what's, you know, good to do and what's not good to do in society um, and toward other people. You know, and, and I mean, as Christians, this is like, this is a major deal because Jesus talks about this. You know, remember the lawyer uh, that tests Jesus and he says, you know, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what does the law say? And the guy rightly answers, you have to love the Lord your God with your whole self, basically, heart, heart soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's an ethical claim, right? That's telling us how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves with each other and, you know, with society at large. Right. And it's, it's one of those things where immediately when people talk about Christians and ethics, everybody in the world is going to start to recoil because they don't like the idea that we have an ethic that would enforce a way of life. But at the same time, they'll make movies like The Purge, where we, we can recognize that if there were just no more ethics, things might be bad. Um, so we need to sort of pin down how we get ours, right? Because everybody agrees to some level, there should be ethics. We don't want to live in The Purge, but also nobody likes to feel bad. Right. You know, this is this is one of the more frustrating things, I think, for Christians in general, because even if you haven't studied philosophy, you kind of get this on an intuitive level. Um, and, and especially for pastors I talk to, but also people who study ethics, because, the you know, the average ethical you know, theory out there that people operate is what I can do what I want as long as I don't hurt anybody else, mm -hmm. which sounds really great and easy on the surface. But. It turns out that it generally makes you into a kind of a useless pile of garbage instead of a productive, normal, functional person, right? Um, because, I mean, you think about it, okay, so if my only ethical consideration is not to do harm, well, what does that mean? Does it mean that I just simply don't punch you in the face? Can I tell you off and tell you that you're dumb? Um, can I let my friend continue in an unhealthy behavior that's killing him? You know, like, like, here's a moral quandary for you. So I have a buddy who likes to eat rat poison. Rat poison is bad right? It'll kill you. So am I a good friend? If I say, Hey man, you do you, you know, you're free to do what you want. It's not hurting me. You can do what you want. Um, am I a good friend? If I just let him keep doing that. I would, I would vote. No, I would vote no as well, because you know, good friends don't let you die. Um, and, then, and then we, you know, we corrupt the meaning of love. You know, what is love in this? You love is permission and acceptance, right? I do let you do what you want. And I accept you for doing, it. in fact, I celebrate you for doing it. Even if what you're doing is corrosive to your soul. So, I, I mean, we're, we're sort of even now sort of taking a, a, a bit of a leap, right? Uh, this is one of those things that at least as a pastor, I, I struggle to communicate a very simple concept over and over again, but sin breaks stuff. Um, mm -hmm. that, that ethic is sort of formed around this, that, that God didn't just sort of like drop down the 10 laws that uh, he just wants us to feel bad and guilty. But, but rather, if you do these things, creation will get worse. Well, and, you know, God doesn't give us the law to, I mean, it is an effect of the law because we're sinners that we feel bad when we transgress it. Right. Mm -hmm. So the law is not there to beat up on me per se, though it does do that. You know, like like there's that uh, St. Augustine said, right, the law always accuses. He's right. It does. As a sinner, it always accuses me. But it is still, you know, good news for us in the broad sense of this is how God structured reality and wants us to live. And that's a good thing. You know, and, and I think that's important to remember that that rules and standards of behavior are not bad. Even if, and doubly so when they cut against me, it's actually a good thing that I'm held in line and my behavior is curbed or I'm shown when I made a mistake or I'm, you know, taught what it's like to live a good life, you know, as, as our catechism would remind us. Right. I, I mean, and this is given by a God who actually doesn't want to see us hurt. Um, right. And that's something to, to sort of recognize that if, if um, we, we have ethics, not just for fun, uh, because they, they're usually in the short term, not. Uh, and we can we can acknowledge that it's it's for the long term gain um, right. that if um, everybody who I annoyed was allowed to kill me, I would be dead by now. Um, I, I've annoyed <laughs> a lot of people. Uh, maybe it's good. Well, you know, I guess let's back up for a minute and we'll talk about kind of there's three different sort of broad categories of ethical discussion in, in philosophy. So the first one is meta ethics, which is the truth questions of morality. So this is where we'd ask, is there really such a thing as right and wrong? How, yeah. how do we know it? You know, this sort of thing. Um, then there's normative ethics and that's determining the right course of action. So, you know, you have a particular moral situation in front of you. Do you go this way? Do you go that way? Do you go over there? 
Um, and then the third one is applied ethics, which is kind of like your, your on the ground code of conduct. How do you handle yourself in any given situation? And there's a number of different schools of thought on this, right? Philosophers have had lots of ideas over the years about what constitutes right behavior and right action and whether there's true or falsity. But one of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers is that we're all relativists now, right? And so ethics are all dependent on a context. And so you know, this is really bad in like corporate America. Talk to somebody who works for a huge business and they'll have their corporate code of conduct that you're expected to go by. Well, what's that rooted in? whatever the board of directors decided on or the HR department or whoever originated. And it feels really arbitrary and empty and dehumanizing because it is, because it's artificial and it feels artificial. This is like, you know, if you've heard about the great resignation, all these people quitting. Well, one of the reasons I think people feel so forgotten about and so dehumanized in their companies is the expected standards of behaviors are not human, right? Because mm -hmm. they're not grounded in reality. They are completely artificial. We, I just noticed, like, it seems like as Christians, we come at this from the exact opposite end as the world. So we start with the idea that there is such a thing as right and wrong, and it's handed down from mm -hmm. on high. And then we work forward into the situation. But it seems right. like the world starts with the situation and then tries to, uh, you know, extrapolate backwards into what right and wrong might be as a whole. Well, I think that goes with to our fascination with science, because that's how science works. I have a thing that I see in the world, and I'm trying to reason backward to where it came from. And we tend to default to do that to ethics. And I just want to cover real quickly kind of the major schools of ethical thought here that you would find if you read an ethics book. So there's virtue ethics. This goes back to Aristotle, and it's about cultivating right patterns of behavior, good habits, right? Hedonism. This is the view that whatever feels good is right, which you can imagine is a very popular view for, for obvious reasons, because our old Adam, our old sinful flesh likes to do what it likes to do, right? There's intuitive ethics, which just sort of assumes we can just know what the right thing is to do. It doesn't have a very strong view of human nature or sin. There's consequentialism, which is just the end result is the only thing that matters. So if I have to, you know, I mean, to use a really overused example, but if I'm Adolf Hitler and I want to fix Germany, and if I have to kill 6 million people to do that, oh, well, well, Germany's fixed at the end, right? Our economy's better now. Um, this is also a lot of people's view when it comes to abortion, actually, right? That we kill off these young babies in the womb because some better thing will happen because we had to give up this child. And it's interesting because if you read even, the, you know, Planned Parenthood's own statistics, the vast majority of abortions are considered elective for, you know, work reasons or, you know, inconvenience reasons or whatever, which is consequentialist ethics, right? Mm -hmm. There's deontology. This one's a little bit more difficult. It's more abstract and scholarly. Uh, this is started by a guy named Immanuel Kant, who's incredibly dense, but uh, it's more of a focus on the act and less on the consequence. So we analyze each moral act in and of itself. And then there's kind of a, where, where I think Christians should fall, which is natural law theory. Okay. Um, which is, which is, uh, uh, there's kind of a subset of that called divine command, which is kind of an oversimplified version of it. But natural law is the idea that there's actually moral laws baked into reality that govern us, right? And so we would say that law is God's law, which he has put into, you know, like Paul says, the law of God is written in our hearts. So even, you know, people who've never read the Ten Commandments know that murder is bad. Sin has unfortunately corrupted us. And so we may not always agree about exactly who is an innocent person, you know, when it comes to murder, because murder is killing innocent people, right? Um, we may not agree about in between culture to culture exactly who that is, but we all agree with the fact that murder is bad. There's no culture on the planet that's ever said that murder is great. Right. So, so if we're going to do this, uh, to, to kind of wrap up as we're, we're getting a little close to time then, um, when we start with the idea that Christians have ethics, uh, why, why do we start with the idea that this is a good thing and, and <coughs> Well, we have we have ethics because it's good to live in a place where people care for each other <clears throat> and don't hurt each other, right? I mean, you read through your small catechism. Fifth commandment doesn't just say it's okay not to punch people. And Jesus adds to that, you know, you shouldn't even be thinking about punching people, right? You don't even want to hate your neighbor in your heart or call him a name because you've already murdered him. But Luther reminds us that also includes we're supposed to actually help people, that the ethic of the Bible goes two ways, right? It's not just about what you don't do. It's also about how you positively conduct yourself toward others. And this is a good thing because isn't this the world we all want to live in where people take care of each other, where, you know, people are kind to each other, where people, you know, bail each other out when there's a, a need that we have. I mean, even secular people aspire for this, but if you don't have a moral framework that actually teaches and holds us accountable to that, it's never going to happen. Not, I mean, yeah, we live in this world full of sin and it's never going to happen perfectly, but, you know, it's certainly not going to do us any favors if we tell everybody that there's no moral commands on their life, that they have no obligation to their neighbor. This has not gone well for us. And I think you see it in, in just the, the, the la just the total anxiety and depression of our general society, how people feel so alone and isolated. 
because we don't see ourselves as connected in, in webs of community that come with ethical commands and, and obligations. Mm-hmm. So the ethical uh, commands and obligations that, that come, they're not just meant to sort of make you feel apart from society uh, or different, but rather they're the things that are supposed to knit you in and make you feel connected. Uh, if you happen to, to then sort of feel apart from it, this is where as Christians too, we don't have only the law because you're right, things are never going to be the way that they ought to be uh, this side of the resurrection, mm-hmm. uh, which is what ethics actually explain, what the law actually explains, how things ought to be. Um, mm-hmm. For that though, we have a gospel. We are knit right. together in something other than our works, but but our our, our Lord that doesn't uh, that doesn't get rid of the need for a gospel uh, or excuse me for an ethic for a law, uh, but but rather it, it shows us over and over again God wants us knit together, and so He calls us to love each other, and even where we fail, He forgives and binds us together anyway. Right, and and when I said you know that the that when I was talking about community, I meant specifically kind of just humanity at large. Yeah, because how do we deal with people who are outside of the church? You know, we're not bound together in Christ. We're bound together, you know, according to the law. And, you know, I, I do have an obligation to, you know, go out into my town here and do things in my community. Um, should I give them the gospel? Absolutely. But I also have an obligation to pay my taxes and mow my lawn and, you know, help out the old lady across the street who doesn't go to church. Right. Um, and that comes with with the law and with, with ethics. And, and this is the thing, too. We, we run into a problem in churches. Well, there's a few problems. And I guess this is probably what we should finish on because I think we're pretty out of time here. But. Um, the fr- one problem is we, we confuse the law and the gospel. We turn mm-hmm. ethics into the gospel, right? We turn how we treat other people into what Jesus died for us to have. And that, that's a huge problem because we never do it perfectly. And if we are saved because of how we act, then we're in a lot of trouble. And so we don't want to go there. We don't want to confuse these two things. We want to keep them straight. Um, they're both important, but one of these gets emphasis, right? And that's, you know, Jesus, he always gets the emphasis. And the second thing is, as Christians, you know, you've noticed that you'll notice as we went through kind of really quickly, these major views of ethics, there was a view that, you know, really focused on the results. And there was a view that really focused on the act. And there was a view that really kind of focused on cultivating good habits. Well, when it comes to Christians and ethics, it's not just about why you do it. It's not just about how you do it. And it's not just about what the end result is. We care about all three parts of the, you know, the ethical act. So you should be serving your neighbor because you love him. And you should do an act that's not intrinsically sinful or wrong to the degree that you're able in your service to him. And it should also produce a desired result because like, you know, the catechism reminds us that we can do things which only appear right, you know, and when we're talking about coveting. And so it can look, it can be the right act objectively, but produce the wrong result. And that's just part of the world that we live in. And so we care about all three segments of that. And this is something about secular ethics that really drives me crazy is they tend to pick one of those three areas and really focus on that. And I don't think that's helpful. Hmm. I like that. So we'll, we'll look at the, the whole of it then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's the whole, right? You got to look at all three parts and all three of them are important. And, and this is where really quickly you figure out exactly how much you need Jesus. You know, because when you sit down and analyze something that you do, you might say, well, I paid my taxes, but I didn't do it out of love for my neighbor. I did it because I'm afraid of the IRS, mm-hmm. you know, that's or you true. could say that, you know, I helped the old lady across the street um, and I did it because I care about her and I love her. And I, I did the right thing, but, you know, it turns out I don't actually know how to fix wiring and I burnt her house down. You know? <laughs> right. I mean, so, you know, this is, this is, this is the sort of stuff in the world we live in. And so it reminds us very quickly that we're very limited and, and we're not actually able to fix this world. And that's, uh, I think, one of the things that Christians with ethics that frustrates non-Christians is that for us, ultimately, ethics reminds us of our own shortfall and our need for a savior. So that's why we're okay with such a, a, a stringent ethic. We, we know that Christ has fulfilled the law for us. It's one of the things that Lutheran funeral sermons never make sense to people who didn't grow up in Lutheranism. You know, every Lutheran pastor I know stands up and says, so-and-so is a sinner and people recoil in horror. But we always fill in the, the part here that's often missing, which is, well, this person's a sinner. They're imperfect. They need Jesus, which is great because that's exactly who Jesus came for, and which is why we know where they are now, Right. Uh, they're with their Lord and uh, people don't fill that in, you know, but, but that's the point, right? The law gives us a need and that need is satisfied in Christ. That's a perfect place to leave it. Pastor, thanks so much. Well, thanks for having me. Take care.